All right, hello all the attendees. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And uh, my name is Ding Zhong from uh, Andrew Ferrans Group. And the topic I'm going to cover today, uh, let, let me actually close the window. Oh, <laughs> Do you, would you want an introduction, Ding? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can give you just Let's a brief introduction. Okay. You want to do that again? Sure. Okay. Yeah, there's some noise outside just happening. Okay. So, all right. So, everyone, this is Ding Zhang, and he's a member of the Ferron group and Naj Perge group. So, he attends group meetings with um, in, in my group sometimes. Uh, he came from the Shadong Shu group, but is now a postdoc and does interesting work with tungsten selenide. Um, uh, centers, defect centers currently, but this work here is going to be on his previous work at Shaodong Shu's group in Seattle. And it's on mostly magnetic effects in Van der Waals materials. I actually remember reading the Science Advances article that you see on the slide there and, and thinking that was a really neat study. Um, Thanks. So everyone give it up for Ding. Okay. So the topic uh, I'm going to cover today is harvesting proximity effect in 2D ferromagnetic semiconductor heterostructure for spin and valley electronics. And the storyline has, in this storyline, there are two publications. One is in 2017, uh, which is a science advanced paper uh, at the lower, lower left. And the other is the Nature Nano, which is published uh, on February this year. So first I'm gonna start with talking about electron degrees of freedom. So we know it has charge uh, with which we made transistors that is really important in the uh, CPU nowadays. And the second one is charge couple device, uh, which is used for imaging. We also know there's a uh, freedom spin and we can make spin valve that is used for hard disk drive storage. We also have magnetic tunnel junction that is used for modern MRAM storage device. So another degree of freedom that we're trying to utilize is called valley. For example, here I'm showing a band structure of uh, a graphene and uh, in, in there, we see two valleys, which are which means the band, uh, the conduction band maximum, a minimum and the valence band maximum. And uh, there are two in equivalent valleys, uh, which uh, exist at k point and minus k point. So if we name it as uh, zero and one, we could use this to encode information. So some of the key aspect in this uh, valley electronics ideas are we need to have distinguishable valleys. We need to be able to achieve valley polarization, detect valley polarization, and we also want to control some valley properties. And uh, a great candidate for valley electronics is transition metal decalcogenize, usually we denote it as MX2 where M stands for molybdenum and, uh, uh, or Townsend. X, I mean, sulfur, sel selenium, or uh, tellurium. So with this, uh, with the combination of this, we got uh, six materials, among which the MLT2 has a relatively small band gap, and the WT2 is a semi-metal. So mostly we're interested in the rest four materials. There are semiconductors with appropriate band gap size, and they have very similar properties. And the property I'm going to introduce in the next several slides are actually shared by all of these four materials. So let's start with taking MOS2 as an example. Uh, it is a, a van der Waals structure, uh, which means it can be exfoliated into a more layer. And something really special about it is that at the uh, model layer of uh, MOS2 becomes a uh, 
direct band gap material, whereas the thicker ones actually has uh, indirect band gap. So uh, due to that reason, if you took a, a image of this sample here, a, a photoluminescence image, uh, what you can see is that only the monolayer area is going to be visible and the rest of the area is dark. And on the right, we have a, a schematic featuring only uh, the band structure at the K and minus K point. So all of them show a photoluminescence uh, and this feature coming, uh, comes from excitonic emissions, uh, which means uh, when we excite it, uh, the excited material, we're gonna have electron hole pair. And in the most of the cases, uh, the material is not gonna be uh, intrinsic without any doping. Usually we have some electron hole doping during the fabrication process. So the most common spectrum we see is that there are two uh, emission peaks. One is the exciton. The other one is the trion, uh, which is, is the exciton picking up an ex extra uh, carrier. Uh, it can be either electron, in which case we call it a negative trial, or a hole, then we call it positive trial. And the energy discrepancy between the trial and the exciton is the bending energy for picking up the uh, third particle. So what makes uh, MX2 a great candidate for valleytronics is that it has no inversion symmetry. For example, for graphene, of which the point group is C6V, and we're gonna have a inversion center. However, for MX2, the point group is D3H, which means there's not gonna be any inversion center. Why this is important? Uh, for example, let's look at some important properties here, like barrier curvature and uh, orbital magnetic moment. And they are all uh, odd with respect to time reversal symmetry. And they are even with respect to inversion symmetry. When both of the symmetry are preserved, they had to uh, vanish. Now without inversion symmetry, we're actually gonna have valley contrasting values for these properties. Some other um, properties that can uh, be non-zero without an uh, inter uh, without um, inverting center is spin orbital coupling and with an obstacle of selection rule. For example, on the right, due to the spin orbital coupling, we see that the valence band is gonna split into uh, two energy level according to their spin polarization. And we will talk about the optical selection rule with greater detail. So here is a, a schematic of the band structure. Uh, usually uh, the spin of the coupling for the valence band is really large that we can render the lower level um, uh, invisible. Let's just uh, ignore that. And we could excite the plus K valley and the minus K valley respectively with sigma plus light and sigma minus light. So when they're excited, uh, we're gonna have the excitons in the plus K valley composed of a spin up electron and a spin down hole. In minus K valley, we're gonna have spin down electron and spin up hole. When these excitons relax, they will emit sigma plus and sigma minus photoluminescence accordingly, and the energy of which respect, uh, reflects the band gap size, uh, optical band gap size of, of this material. So now we have covered how we have distinguished values and we, achieve, uh, we can achieve value polarizations, we can detect value polarizations, and I'm gonna talk about control of value properties. So if we wanna break the energy degeneracy between the two valleys, uh, immediate idea 
that come to mind is using the magnetic field because we need to break the time reversal symmetry. With the time reversal symmetry there, we know that we have to have the spin down band in plus K valley, uh, energy degenerated with the spin up band in the minus K valley. So now with the magnetic field, there are three effects. One is called spin. So the band is gonna shift according to their spin polarization. And we, saw, we also have of the magnetic moment. And the third one is, is called valley, which is coming from the barrier curvature. You can understand them as self-rotating uh, electron wave package. And uh, all of them are linear in B. So a combination of them gives us a, a Z-man effect with a, a slope of 260 me, uh, micron electron volt per tesla. Let's translate to G equals minus four, which is pretty good. And as an example here, we compare the photoluminescence for WSC2 at 5.7 Tesla with zero Tesla. You see a 1.5 milli electron volt shift for this peak energy, which is for, for both trion and exciton. So this is coming from the Z-man effect. Uh, 15 second pause for questions. So once again, if you have any questions, you can raise your hand and I'll allow you to talk or you can submit them into the Q&A bank. Let's see. Okay, so here's, here's okay. a question. Yeah, that's a great question. So if we look at this structure here, Uh, we looks like we have uh, six valleys, but uh, in fact, these three K valleys, they're connected by uh, the, uh, you can shift them, they're equivalent because uh, the relative momentum vector from one point to the other point is the size of the uh, Bouillon zone. So they are actually uh, e equivalent um, in that sense, does that make, uh, make sense? If you, if you add in uh, the, um, I forgot what's that called, the, the reciprocal la uh, lattice vector, you can get from here to there, which means they're actually the same thing. Okay, any more? Okay. So the idea for my project is that instead of using the magnetic field, we have another source of breaking the time reversal symmetry, which is using the proximity effect. Uh, if we can bring something magnetic in, pro in the vicinity of the material and introducing uh, uh, electron uh, wave overlap, we could achieve much stronger uh, effect in, in principle. So what I, try, what I tried to do is using this uh, magnetic material called CI3. And it is also a Van der Waals magnetic uh, material, which means it can be uh, mechanically exfoliated into very thin flakes. And at that point of experiment, uh, the fuel layer of CI3 was still hard to achieve. So in the first project, we used a uh, relatively thin CI3 that is 10 nanometer thick. And the CI3, uh, people, has, uh, people had already known that it is a monoclinic at room temperature and room behavior at low temperature, uh, important. Uh, number to remember is that it ha it go through a current uh, transition at 61 Kelvin, which means below 61 Kelvin is going to be ferromagnetic. 
So uh, in this first project, I made a device that looks like this. I had a WRC2 interface with a 10 nanometer thick CI3. Uh, both of them are encapsulated in boron nitrides. That boron nitride are used for uh, protection for deg degradation. So by comparing the photoluminescence spectrum I took uh, above and below TC, uh, you see that uh, you see very uh, contrasting results. For the spectrum on the left, we have overlapping results between the sigma plus and the sigma minus, uh, which means uh, the time reversal symmetry is preserved. However, on the right one, we have a different result for sigma plus and sigma minus, uh, which means the time reversal symmetry was already broken. And that means the CI3 must had already magnetized. So the spontaneous magnetization was uh, already happening. So what's the origin of this emission peak? By adding a, a electrical gate, we can do, uh, tune the doping in this device. And what I saw is that uh, the emission that dominates the zero voltage uh, is actually the, uh, the positive trial. And we actually see a little bit of exciton on the higher energy side. If you look at spectrum here, the exciton is actually somewhere here. And the main peak we have is the positive trial. So this, uh, agrees well with the DFT simulation for the band structure. And you see that first, they form a type two band alignment with WSC2 conduction band lies below, sorry, lies above uh, the CI3 conduction bind and the valence bind uh, of WSC2 is also above that of CI3. The second observation uh, is that all the CI3 connection band that is below WSA2 is being polarized. So first we use rho to uh, denote the uh, intensity difference between uh, the spectrum. So we define rho as the intensity difference normalized by the intensity summation, which gives us 0 0.3 in this case. So the intensity difference uh, it's coming from uh, the uh, ultra fast uh, spin selective charge hopping. Uh, when the minus K value is excited, we're gonna have the spin down, and we're gonna have the exciton with spin down uh, electrons. And these electrons are allowed to transfer into the CI3 band, thus quenching the emission from the minus K value. However, in the plus K value, and that's charge tran uh, tra transfer is not allowed because the anti-aligned spins. And therefore we're gonna have a stronger emission from the plus K valley. And second uh, phenomenon is the uh, energy shift between the sigma plus and the sigma minus. In this case, we have 3.5 milli electron volt energy shift the power dependence show uh, relatively independent of the power of the laser that we use. So we exclude any uh, population related phenomenon for the main cause of this uh, splitting. So therefore I will ascribe that to uh, the proximity field. So we, if we just make a comparison between this uh, the strength of this uh, exchange field and uh, the Zeeman effect, which means we divide the 3.5 milli electron volt by 260 micron electron volt per Tesla, we get an effective magnetic field of about 13 Tesla, uh, which is pretty strong and note that we had not applied any magnetic field yet at this point. So what if the magnetic field 
is applied. Here I have the photoluminescence intensity dependence on the applied magnetic field and the field uh, is swept from the negative field to positive field. We see several plateau areas and four of the sampling spectrum I took at this white uh, aerial location are shown on the right. And clearly you see a three times sign flipped in rho and delta, which indicates that the magnetization has flipped for three times. Before we dive into the reason, let's take a look at this transition process. So this transition happens really fast. If we compare 0 0.8 Tesla a sigma minus spectrum with the 0 0.0806 Tesla, we already have a peak energy shift of four mini electron volt. Uh, by comparison, if we look at a plain WSC2 device with the main effect, uh, comparing the, the spectrum taken at minus 5.65 Tesla with that of 5.65 Tesla, we only uh, can achieve 1.5 milli electron volt energy shift. So uh, in short, uh, this process achieves uh, the energy tuning, the switching, uh, uh, with a speed of about three orders magnitude faster than a plan WC2 device. So now let's take a look at this uh, sign flip thing. If we plot out uh, the row as a function of magnetic field, we see that uh, it looks like this, a, a clear, uh, sign flips three times. And then we try to f put our laser on a different location on the device. And what we find uh, was uh, interestingly, the dependence was completely different. So to understand that, uh, I, th I, th I thought I, what I should do was I, you, I, do, uh, I do a raster scan over the whole sample at a certain field and then I changed the field and did another raster scan to looking out uh, to, to, to looking for any uh, non-local information, a non-local dependence of this uh, uh, index row. So what I had was uh, looking at this, uh, with an increasing field where we start at minus 1.1 Tesla, where we have a negative, a positive value for rho uh, at this neg uh, negative magnetic field, which means uh, the, the magnetization at this point was pointing downward in the direction of external field. However, if we ramp the field up, we're starting to have this anti-aligned magnetic domains. And the domain pattern actually evolves when the field is ramped. And finally, we have a, a negative value of rho everywhere, which means now the magnetization is pointing up. So, uh, sweeping the field from the other direction, we get very similar result. In fact, if you compare this minus 0.72 Tesla result with the positive 0.72 Tesla result, we see that they have the exact same domain pattern with that the direction of the domain is just uh, exactly opposite. And we call them time reversal pairs because they are actually related to each other by time reversal symmetry. And now if we look at this location, they actually flipped magnetization by three times. So we call this area weak domain. It's just a notation. And for this area, 
they only flip magnetization once, we call the, the strong domain. So if we uh, put our focus on our laser on the weak domain, we are actually going to get this uh, characteristic uh, pattern of the three times sine flip. However, if we focus our laser on the strong domain, we're going to get the sine flip for only once. And the uh, mechanism for this uh, phenomenon is that we can understand it as a energy competition between uh, the dipolar energy, the exchange energy, and the domain wall energy. And uh, at the strong external field, the magnetization is going to be overwhelmed by the external field, and therefore it will be pointing at the direction of external field. When external field is weaker, uh, it tends to form this kind of domain structure to minimize uh, the free energy of the system. And in fact, uh, if we uh, put the laser in the middle of the uh, weak domain and strong domain, we're gonna see this pattern uh, gradually evolve from the weak domain pattern into a strong domain pattern, uh, which you know, unravel a very uh, abundant magnetization dynamics in this material. So in, in summary, we review a ultra fast a spin selective charge hopping. And we have uh, achieved large effective magnetic field at spontaneous magnetization. We saw fast switching of valley splitting and valley polarization via flipping the magnetization of CI3. And we find a creative method to reveal the domain pattern in CI3 by detecting the valley polarization in WSC2. So 50, uh, 15 seconds for questions. Uh, so I have one. Um, if you have, it's it's interesting that you have a domain that flips and then it flips back. Um, do you have an explanation for that? It flips and flips back and then flips back again. Yeah, yeah. So at this field, um, it flips. Uh, the domain flips even before the external field has changed its sign, because this mechanism is gonna minimize the dipolar energy in this system. If you look at the dipolar energy, they're, they're between this, you can, uh, they're between this domain and that domain, where they're anti-aligned, the dipolar energy is actually gonna be minimized. And that's how this domain is helping to reduce the free energy of the system. Okay. Um, there's also another question on here. Uh, and I guess I'm supposed to read them out so that they'll be recorded on the the feed. So this one is, why are domains for increasing, decreasing fields so analogous? Why is there a sort of time reversal to them? Do we not expect significant randomness in the forming of the domains? Yeah. So um, yeah, that was really an uh, interesting thing that we absorbed. Uh, and we try to understand it. And what I th think would be the best explanation is that uh, if you think about this, uh, comparing the history of this and that, uh, the one on the left, we have minus 0 0.72 Tesla with the field going from the negative end into the positive end. And if we just do a time reversal of that process, what we get is that the field sweeping from the positive end to the negative end, and the field of minus 0 0.72 Tesla is going to be 0 0.72 Tesla after time reversal transformation. And the result will also follow that time reversal uh, transformation, uh, which means the magnetization will be reverse when you do the time reversal uh, transformation. And 
I think that's why we have the exact same pattern with just opposite uh, value for this uh, magnetization. I think that really works well and this shows that our device is really repeatable and uh, uh, neat. Any other questions? Feel free to raise your hand and we can have you talk as well. Okay, great. All right, so for this uh, second pro project, uh, in, in the first project, I used a relatively thick CR3 that was 10 nanometer. So after some time, uh, we, were, we achieved uh, fabrication of thinner CR3, and we gained some important knowledge of the magnetization in this few layer CI3s. So in this uh, second project, I'm going to use the trilayer and the bilayer CI3 to help me understand the layer resolved magnetic proximity effect better. So let me quickly go through some important properties that we uh, know at the point of the project. So the arm CD experiment is an optical uh, measurement that measures thin film magnetization. Basically, it reveals the overall magnetization in this system. So we find that at a negative magnetic field, uh, the trilayer CI3 is going to start with the down, down, down state. And when the field ramps up, we're starting to have this down, up, down state. which transit into up, down, up state. And finally, and, and it ends up uh, with up, up, up state at positive magnetic field. So uh, in short, it tends to stay at a, a anti-ferromagnetic aligned ferromagnetic layers. And when, however, when the external field is too strong, every layer is going to be aligned with the external field. So what does rho and delta respond to these transitions? So here we have observed uh, these transitions in rho and delta at the exact set field value to that of RMCD. However, uh, the magnitude and direction of the transition can be different from uh, the RMCD. Uh, before we dive into the details, let's take a look at the bilayer result as well. So the bilayer similarly uh, start with down down state at an active magnetic field, which transit into a up-down state or down-up state that we don't know. And finally, at positive field, it's going to be at up-up state. So similar story for bilayer uh, in the WSC2 photoluminescence, we also observe these jumps. Uh, at the same field value of CI3's magnetization, and let's try to put them together and summarize some common features. So for this really large jumps, uh, which are the jumps on the right, we see this jump actually uh, corresponds to the interfacial CI3 layer, uh, rever reversing its magnetization. And On the left, for these smaller jumps, uh, this corresponds to uh, the secondary layer CI3 reversing its magnetization. 
So also in, in we know that in those in, in last project, we also have this little jump over there, which I didn't know why, but now I I guess it could be the secondary layer in that um, in that uh, CI three stack uh, is reverse. To understand this phenomenon, uh, this is coming from a prime primer primary charge hopping into the interfacial layer from the WSA2 into the CI3. And this hopping is reinforced if the secondary layer is also uh, spin aligned. Whereas for the delta, we have, we have this large jump when the interfacial CI3 magnetization is flipped. And we have a jump that is in an opposite direction uh, to that in row. And we, to understand this phenomenon, we need to consider a kinetic exchange interaction uh, framework. And uh, so suppose here we draw out the uh, conduction band for WSE2 and the CI3. That is the interfacial layer and that is the secondary layer. And when the uh, electron wave uh, for the, of this WSE2 is overlapped with CI3, the electron it can have this virtual hopping process where it hops into the CI3 and back. And the hopping amplitude is indicated by TC. And if we write down Hamiltonian in the base of where the electron is located, uh, for example, the, the first, the first uh, base we use is that electron is uh, staying at WSC2 layer, and the second base is that WSC2, uh, that the electron stay at the CI3 layer. So we're gonna have the Hamiltonian written in a matrix like that, whereas the delta C is the uh, energy difference between the conduction band of WSU2 and CI3. So we could get a correction term for the uh, band edge of this WSU2 um, conduction band that amounts to TC square over delta C. Similarly, when the secondary layer is aligned, now the electron could stay either in WSU2 a top layer CI3 or the secondary layer CI3. So we have to write the Hamiltonian in a three times three matrix, whereas the DC denotes the hopping between two CI3 layers. Uh, with some mathematical method, we could actually get the uh, correction for this uh, band edge energy that looks like this. And uh, the, the publication came out at the same time I did this research and that simulation, it was a simulation on the CI3 band structure. And it shows that the valence bind of CI3 is also uh, spin polarized. So that means the same picture will work also for the valence bind. And ultimately the optical transition energy is gonna be the energy shift of conduction bind minus that of valence bind. So for FM state, for AM and AF FM state, we're gonna have different value of them. Uh, with reasonable choice of parameters, of course we don't have an exact idea how strong those uh, values should exactly be but we, with some reasonable choice, we could reproduce uh, the value that we saw in the experiment uh, pretty well. And with this phenomenon, we now have a way to resolve the, uh, the interfacial layer and the bottom layer because WSC2 respond to them differently. So that helps us to have some layer resolve the imaging of the CI3 magnetization. For example, 
for this bilayer device uh, in spontaneous magnetization case. Uh, if we do the traditional RMCD measurement, we're just gonna have vanishing uh, result everywhere. And that's because the CI3 stays either in the up-down state or down-up state. However, if you do the photoluminescence measurement on the uh, WSC2 layer, we could actually see the domain uh, between the down-up state and the up-down state. Uh, when the field is ramped, we could see this domain pattern could redistribute into new domain patterns. Here we have zero Tesla up and zero Tesla down. In fact, also, uh, if you focus your laser uh, a, at one of the domain, here we name it as one and two, uh, you could see the magnetic dependence of rho is uh, having a contrasting result between the domain one and domain two. In the domain one, we have this large jump on the right and the small jump on the left. In domain two, we have the large jump on the left and the small jump on the right. And that agrees with the fact that in the middle, uh, we have a down up state in domain one and we have an up-down state in domain two. Another interesting thing that we could uh, use this property uh, to do is that we observe how the transition from the anti-ferromagnetic state into the ferromagnetic state happens. So for example, here at 0, 0.5 Tesla, uh, we have a AFM state of bilayer CI3. So the red means it is in the down up state. And the blue color means it is in up up state, which means uh, the CI3 is transit from the AFM state into the FM state. And we could see that it actually emerges locally at 0 0.55 Tesla and expands until the whole area of this flake is now in the FM state. So this whole process actually uh, took place between a field span of 0.2 Tesla. Uh, with traditional RMCD measurement, this uh, process is uh, less obvious to see. And as a summary, uh, this few layers actually allow us to study the magnetic proximity effects layer by layer. And we uncover the spin dependent charge hopping from WSC2 into CI3 is dominated by the interfacial layer. The proximity exchange field is a result of the layer magnetic structure as a whole. And we also, for the first time, observed the bilayer domain structure of CI3. And we observed location dependence a coercive field, which is likely introduced by the strain. And thanks uh, for attention and I will I'll be welcoming questions. All right, any questions? All right, here's one from Nathaniel. <clears throat> How would magnetization of chromium triiodide layers look for a four layer system? Would only one layer flip magnetization at a time? Multiple or also related, is this magnetization of layers related to the formation of magnons in XYZ or XXZ spin change chains? So uh, for the magnetization of uh, the CI3 layer for four layer system, uh, it will uh, go through a similar uh, process. It starts from four layer pointing downward into one layer upward. Uh, and then bi layer, two layer upward 
and the th uh, three layer upward and four layer upward. Uh, whereas in the middle, there are some randomness between different samples. So some sample, for example, for the uh, three layer up, one layer down state, it could be up, down, up, up. It could also be up, up, down, up. And uh, we saw for different sample, this different state appears. And uh, the up state is always in the secondary layer or the third layer because uh, anti-ferromagnetic aligned structure is favored for this uh, Thr3 material. Oh yeah, there is another part there is any, is this magnetization of layers at all related to the formation of magnons in um, spin chains? Um, um, for this question, I'm not uh, sure about the answer to that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so another, another point is, is there any asymmetry between uh, the layer that's closest to the tungsten diselenide versus the layer that's that's farthest away, uh, say in in like a four layer system, is any is the one closer to the tungsten selenide ever more or less likely to transition? Uh, uh, where's the question? I, I cannot find the question. Uh, this was just my own question. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, can I repeat? Um, it is so. Say you have a larger layer system, three or four layers, is the layer closest to the tungsten diselenide any uh, more or less susceptible to magnetic domain flips than other layers? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, we, we, we didn't see uh, anything indicative of that. Uh, in fact, we also tried to uh, put the WSC2 on a four layer to uh, try to distinguish a different state. Uh, but we, we didn't see that uh, tendency and uh, uh, we also see that in four layer, five layer, there are a lot of randomness in the states uh, that is hard to control and uh, that makes the identification of the uh, CI3 state difficult because we have now, we have four freedom. We have uh, the magnetization in uh, for each of the layer and to pin down them is going to be much harder uh, with the technique that we have therefore for in this project our experiment is limited uh, to the tri-layer and the bilayer okay. interesting any other questions So have you studied uh, any on the, um, just the effects of say, intervalley um, scattering and, and such on um, they kind of what maybe broadens and, and makes the, the peaks narrower or um, what effects the magnets have on that? The, inter the intervalley scattering in this system is actually, uh quite low because if you compare the spin of uh, the of the band between uh, if the, the spin of the state between uh, minus k and plus k they are opposite and they are also separated by the momentum so for for that scattering to to happen it is actually quite difficult and the rate it was found to be really slow and that, that's also a great factor that makes this material a great valleytronics uh, device because it suppresses intervalley uh, scattering. Great. Interesting.
Okay, last call for questions. Hi, hi Ding, I have one question. Um, I guess a, a lot of your talk, you're talking about like, uh, you know, fixing the number of layers and then driving the, uh, the transition with the magnetic field. Um, and I guess kind of going back to what you were talking about before with like, you know, more layers, uh, would you expect it to be interesting to like fix the magnetic field and then try to drive the transition by adding layers? Or is that something that's possible? Or I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, what do you mean by adding layers? Like, uh, like you talked about like the, the bilayer and the trilayer system. Yeah. Uh, would you expect to be able to drive through a transition by adding layers? Um, and, you know, I guess you, you said experimentally, it's hard to control systems with more layers, but. Yeah, we, we, we cannot add uh, layers uh, amid the experiment. We have to make this device beforehand and then we put the device into the cryo set and cool it down. So we cannot. Uh huh. But maybe I guess like if you manufactured like uh, a series of these devices with increasing numbers of layers, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so, it, just, it was interesting to me for another reason, but uh, it seems similar to some other stuff that I had uh, seen in other contexts. But. Oh, yeah. So if we have a device that is having partially bilayer, partly trilayer, so in the bilayer region, we're going to have that bilayer phenomenon. And in the trilayer region, we'll have simply have the trilayer phenomenon happening. That's um, what we observed, yeah. Okay. Um, all right, I guess people are sort of filtering out now. Um, thanks a lot, Dean. Wish we could have a mm -hmm. applause from everyone here. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, thank you. Thank you for good talk. organizing. The event. I appreciate all the, the pictures and it, it's just very interesting to see how how it, the images work with the domains. You can actually see domains flipping and such. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I remember that was actually kind of a eureka moment for my PhD. I Because I, 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 I saw these transitions first and I was troubled for quite a few weeks until I left the system to do the raster scan and then I went home that night and the second day of my work, I came here and I saw this result. I was like, holy shoot, I know what's happening for yeah. the whole time. Yeah. And the whole story suddenly just unra unravel in front of myself. And that was really exciting for me, that moment. So I think I was, that, that, that that moment was really um, uh, remembered. Oh man, yeah, I bet it, it's just so clear with the photoluminescence. Yeah, it's great. <laughs>